Hello, everyone, and welcome to my final project for my CRIM 611 Ethics and Criminal Justice course. Uh, I created about a 15-minute online training course via a platform called EdApp. Um, this did have a few technical <laughs> glitches, so I'm going to try to get through this. I had to redo it in Zoom and what have you. Um, and also, I'm asking for forgiveness in advance. I do have a bit of a cold and a cough, so I'm going to try to get through this with uh, the least amount of coughing as I can. Um, and so this is a, to be, was set up to be a synchronous in-person uh, in person ethics training that will be geared towards all new and veteran uh, police officers of the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, the title is Developing Self-Restraint and Addressing Unnecessary Force in Policing. After reviewing uh, IMPD's Code of Ethics Statement, there was one uh, sentence that really stood out to me that I want to focus on here, and it is, I will enforce the law courteously and appropriately, never employing unnecessary force or violence. Uh, this training is important for all officers because it will help to promote continued understanding of the use of force and uh, use of force policies and legal aspects. Moreover, it has become very, very, very important to develop better communication and de-escalation skills when police officers are in the field um, due to the increase in com complaints of unnecessary force and police brutality. The majority of the resources used here were from the National Institute of Justice, uh, the U.S. Government Accountability Office, and there's a couple of YouTube videos to add like some real life visuals to, to aid in driving home the seriousness of this uh, really pressing and systemic matter. Uh, there will be some videos in here that are kind of sensitive, so just a uh, forewarning there. Um, I hope this training, my hope is that, you know, this training get, brings more clarity and deep thought and real understanding, and most importantly, motivates true change uh, within the IMPD and with really with police departments all around the country. Uh, so as I said, this is meant to be for all a uh, mandatory training for all incoming and veteran officers. Uh, this was go this is going to be an in person meeting that will uh, commence annually. It is particularly particularly ap applicable again to men and women in blue to promote continued understanding of the use of force policies and legal aspects. And as I mentioned again, the importance of uh, developing um, healthy communication and you know, sharpening those de-escalation skills in the field. Um, of course, this goes towards rebuilding trust within, you know, the communities that police officers serve. Some of the objectives here, again, mandatory training for new officers. Um, additionally, this training will be administered to all officers annually, so from like top to bottom, because I just think it's, it, it's important all the way around, you know, and if the ones at the top can get it, uh, the training and see how important it is and enforce it all the way down, I think we'll be in, in good shape to, you know, initiate some change. Um, it's to understand the force, uh, force in policing, because we know it does have to happen, but how much force, when to use it. Learn when and when not to use lethal force, developing self-restraint tactics to develop self-restraint. Uh, I also believe that with successful completion and consistent application of this training in the field, unnecessary force complaints will decrease by 50%. Furthermore, this training is important. It will enable officers to truly safeguard lives, be exemplary in obeying the laws of the land and the department regulations. Uh, the men and women in blue must live up to their code of ethics, which states that they shall never employ unnecessary force or violence. So when we take a look at force and policing on a deeper level, um, it says officers should use only what's necessary uh, in terms of force to reduce the chance of an incident escalating uh, to make an arrest or protect themselves or others from harm. Uh, the required amount of force utilized should suffice to make an arrest, protect themselves, or innocent bystanders, right? The different levels or continuum of force is used by police to include verbal direction, physical restraint, less lethal force, and lethal force. Here we have a uh, image of just like officer presence, you know, sometimes this can be this, of course, the continuum here from least force to lethal force. Sometimes just the presence of an officer can deter uh, crime for sure. Then next, it would ideally, it would like to see you go to verbal, uh, empty hand control, which is soft, 
what they call soft um, <clears throat> empty hand, which is basically, you know, you use joint locks, restraints to subdue the subject. It's non-lethal. Uh, there are two types, soft text technique mentioned above and hard technique, which can involve punches and sometimes kicks if necessary to subdue the subject. Uh, less lethal force includes a blunt impact of a time or other uh, projectile, chemical, pepper spray, what have you. And then of course we have the stun gun or taser. Um, and last is lethal force. It should be used as the very last result, resort and um, also to stop lethal harm to the officer or again, innocent bystanders. I wanted to make mentions is learning when and when not to use excessive uh, force. The image here is, again, is of a 16-year-old Black kid whose initial crime was jaywalking on his way to school. Um, he was summoned by an officer after he, you know, allegedly started yelling profanities at him. Uh, so here it states uh, a few cases that were seen in, in court, Tennessee versus Gardner, um, Cooper versus Sheehan, and then uh, Plumhoff versus uh, Ricard. And this, you know, just briefly, uh, officers may not use deadly force to apprehend a fleeing suspect who poses no threat. Okay, of course, that happened with the uh, Eric Gardner case. A uh, suspect may not be deemed dangerous just because they have a weapon. Okay, and a lot of officers see that in their training most times says, if you see a weapon, you know, immediately be on guard, tactical mindset, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, kill or be killed, you know, and it's just, it's not always the case. Many people lawfully and responsibly own weapons, and that does not mean that they are a threat to police officers. Um, it says an officer does not possess the unfettered authority to shoot a member of the public simply because that person is carrying a weapon. And then the last, a suspect who flees uh, arrest in a motor vehicle may, depending on the facts, pose a grave safety risk that authorizes the use of deadly force. Here we have a uh, video that I'll speed up just a little bit. Again, trigger warning for those of you that may be watching it. Um, but again, just videos in here to kind of drive home the point. Visuals are always very um, powerful in many regards. So, uh, of course, that's always, I've watched that several times now, but that's always just very disturbing to me. Um, here you got a guy, you know, for one, was completely innocent of whatever the police thought that, you know, <laughs> he was guilty of, you know, and how just, you know, blase, you know, matter of fact, the cop was about, you know, this, this it's not our guy, you know, do what you want. It sucks, you know, for the cop, it's, it just quote unquote sucks. But for that person that's being stopped by the police and handcuffed and 
told to lay on the ground, you know, face down, spread eagle. It's dehumanizing. It's um, it's embarrassing. It's traumatizing. You know, so many things. So you know, this 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 happens way 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 more often than it should. Um, so here. At this part of your training, I'm asking for participants to take 10 minutes to discuss the video with the person to the right of you. Um, and together, they are to come up with three things that were done wrong and three things that were done right in the video. And then asking um, these new officers, uh, new and old alike, how would each of you have done things differently? And then be prepared to share with the rest of the class. And then um, this, um, among other uh, activities and exercises in this training, is everything's being evaluated for their uh, readiness for the field. Again, here's another video, uh, very, very short, uh, but again, just for warning, uh, trigger warning here. And again, we have um, just, <laughs> for lack of a better way to put it, just disregard for human life. Um, the officer, all the all the gentlemen did, if you go back and watch the video, just simply turned towards um, the officer and he was shoved down to the ground and knocked unconscious. Um, the officer then blatantly lied, caught on camera and said, oh, I didn't use unnecessary force. Well, what would you call that? And then uh, what bothered me even more in the video was just seeing like, hey, just a disregard for him as a person who was uh, unconscious, just kind of rolled his body around like a rag doll. And, you know, luckily that officer was fired. You know, that doesn't happen all the time, as we know. But yeah, again, here's another exercise for them to break and take 10 to discuss the video, this time with the person to their left. Together, they're going to discuss what you think the subject did wrong. Um, if there were no cameras present, it's a, uh, it's a question I wanted for them to each answer. Um, and you were the non-offending officer, so the one that did not do the pushing, would you report your fellow officer why or why not? And then each person is to be prepared to share. Again, the exercise is being evaluated. Um, I love quotes, powerful quotes. And this one says, what does self-restraint mean to you? Self-restraint is the very keystone of the ethics of vow taking. That's Mahatma Gandhi. So here we can, you know, getting into defining self-restraint to hold instinctive desires in check and refrain from giving full expression to them in conduct. Self-restraint is a skill with a higher purpose that should be on the high priority list of every police officer. Uh, people who show self great self-restraint usually are diligent, reliable, and peaceful. People with low self-restraint are usually uninhibited in their attitudes, their thoughts, and most definitely their actions. I uh, came up with a, a acronym here, Tactics to Develop Self-Restraint, RAD. Uh, rep stands for Recognize, Assess, Align, and Discipline. Basically, recognizing when you feel a rise in your emotions, breathe deeply three times, um, whatever judgments you have in your head about the situation that you're encountering, try to get rid of those. And it says doing this will result in you, you know, how you come across your communication, verbal and nonverbal, and of course, your actions. Um, being aware is the first step to change for sure. Um, assess the situation to uh, learn to efficiently identify what triggers you in any given situation. You know, do you not like what you're seeing or do you have a prejudice, a deep, you know, uh, racism inside of your body? You know, does it, is it sexism? Do you, you know, you're not like the neighborhood or the people, the community that you serve. All of these are triggers that can cause you to act um, unethically. Align is dig deep to your true understanding of yourself and who you want to be on the job. Then ask, does how you're conducting yourself in the field align with who you really want to be? 
And then, of course, discipline. All of this takes practice and discipline. And um, again, practice makes perfect. So continuously work on how you respond when you're in the field. Again, if at all possible, remember to, you know, start with your de-escalation training versus going right into the tactical all the time. And to a reminder to respond and not uh, react. Here is another video. Uh, this is more of a role play. Um, it could be triggering to some, but it's definitely not like real life um, things like we saw in the previous two videos. But again, worth sharing. So again, that was a great display of how things should happen, especially with people who are experiencing um, any type of emotional trauma, you know, in the in, in the field of mental health breakdowns, you know, I definitely think there should be more training in that regard when it comes to cops, uh, because a lot of times what they experience in the field when they come across, you know, these types of citizens is, you know, they're having a full out, they're not even aware of what's happening. They're in a full trauma moment and, you know, it's fight or flight for them. And so for the cops, a lot of times it's fight or flight for them. And, you know, people end up getting unnecessarily hurt because they're not, cops are not properly trained on how to deescalate those types of situations. Um, so again, since now it's your turn, I'll again, take 10 minutes to think about what you would do differently. Um, then I asked for six volunteers, decide who will be the cop and who will be the veteran. And they each, you know, switch. It's not on the slide here, but ideally I'd want them to switch. You know, whoever plays the veteran plays the cop, then you switch roles. And, you know, the goal here is to get the veteran to safely surrender his weapon. And again, exercise is being evaluated. Something to remember, another quote here, there's no greater threat to a free and democratic nation than a government that fails to protect its citizens' freedom and liberty as aggressively as it pursues justice. Uh, that's by Bernard Carrick. That was very, very powerful for me. That made me think a lot. Um, so definitely something to uh, remember there. And the conclusion, um, you know, again, today we focused on a, a tiny but crucial part of IMPD's code of ethics statement I will enforce the law courteously and appropriately without fear or favor, malice or ill will, never employing unnecessary force or violence. Uh, this training was meant to be particularly applicable to all of our men and women in blue, top to bottom, to promote continued understanding of the issue of the use of force policies and developing self-restraint. More importantly, it has become essential to develop better communication and de-escalation skills overall. Uh, when this training is put into place in the field, it should result in a significant drop in un unnecessary force and police brutality complaints. The use of force should be placed in an ethical context so that all officers can understand the extent to which it affects human dignity and subsequently find a balance between excessive use of force and blatant avoidance of situations requiring justified force. Here are some of my resources here. 
And then I came up with, you know, an assessment, of course, time to evaluate uh, a few questions. Do you think a necessary force is an issue in this country? Why or why not? Uh, what does RAD stand for? So for them to go back and kind of think about that acronym, explain each in detail and in your own words, how will you apply this concept once you're clear to go into the field? Discuss a time when you exercise unethical behavior that you weren't proud of. How did you rectify it or wish you'd rectified it? Again, I tell them there's this uh, essay format type of um, evaluation. You have one hour to complete this assessment. Each answer must be two to 300 words. Your CO or commanding officer and a member of HR will discuss the results and their implications, uh, the implications of those results with their officers. Um, and you can take this training again in 30 days if they see fit. So training is complete. If they're, they've passed, certificates will be emailed to their commanding officers to distribute along with assessment results. Thank you all for watching, and I hope that you enjoyed.